pray. Will you stand with me, please, this morning? Let us hear the word of God as we continue to go through chapter 6 of the Gospel of John. If you're using our Pew Bible, it's on page 1056 or 1057. Let us hear the words of the living God, the one true and living God, who has breathed out Scripture. Verse 52, Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate man and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. You may be seated. Now more than ever in our lifetime, those who are the church must be out in all the world preaching Christ and him crucified. We must follow the course of Jesus as he was in all the world and taught the one true way of salvation. He did this while living in a certain society with certain things going on, cultural issues going on. This is a necessity for us when the tides of the culture are increasingly going the wrong way. When there is growing resistance and hostility to the truth and the principles of the Christian faith, what is the church to do? Are we called to succumb to the pressures and ideas of the world and retreat and be quiet? Or are we called to mount up as the Calvary of God and engage, contend, and be actively present for Christ? For the cause of God in this fallen, dark, broken world. The Great Commission is for everyone who truly names the name of Christ. It is for all who believe in Christ, the Lord Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. This is a command from God that each Christian is to obey. Every one of us. This obedience comes from God working in us from salvation on through the Christian life. Today I want to examine these these verses, 52 through 59, through the lens of the Great Commission. Oftentimes, the Great Commission is commonly only recited from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, but it is found in Mark and Luke as well. To have a proper understanding of our calling, we must read them together. So I want to read them as the lens through which we see Jesus in his teaching in this synagogue in Capernaum where we are to follow Jesus into all the world. So go with me first to Matthew verse, uh, chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Now go to Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 15. Mark 16, 15. He said to them, 
Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now go to Luke 24. Verse 45. Luke 24, verse 45. Then he opened their minds. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Let us go back to John. Now there is a lot to be said about these passages and how they fit together in explaining the Great Commission, what the Great Commission is all about, what we are called to do. But for our study in John, we make a simple point that every Christian is to be present and active in the world where we are to preach and teach the gospel on behalf of Jesus. We are ambassadors for Christ. So we are to preach Christ and him crucified, which is a proclamation about repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus. A lot of this will come in the context of cultural issues as we live in our day and attach all these cultural issues that we face, all the hustle and bustle of life, and attach that to the gospel of Christ. Bring them through these issues to Christ and Him crucified. We see Jesus doing this in our passage for today. We see Him and all of Scripture doing this over and over again. He is present in all the world and he is proclaiming the way of salvation so that sinners can come and have life in him. Come to him for life and live actively in that life that he has given them. So essentially, this is a twofold outline for our time today. Number one, being active in all the world. Being active in all the world. And number two, teaching all the world. Teaching all the world. The first thing we see about being active in the world is in verse 52, where a sharp argument arose between uh, those who have been listening to Jesus. We don't get much detail as exactly what uh, is going on, on, what they're saying exactly. But we know it's about Jesus saying that uh, they needed to eat his flesh. They were wrestling with that, what that meant. And this brought up an argument. Maybe some were defending what Jesus really meant because they were true believers like his 11 true disciples. And they were arguing with those who didn't get it. Or maybe it was arguments between different misunderstandings of what Jesus was saying. And this was maybe between various false disciples. Most likely, much of the arguing was about the utter impossibility that it seemed to be to eat Jesus' flesh. And whatever that meant, whatever they thought it meant, it's hard to tell the details of the argument. But the point we make out of this is that Jesus didn't shy away from debate. In fact, there was already grumbling going on earlier, and he stayed coarse in proclaiming and teaching the truth, his truth. He stayed in the conversation and interaction with these people. So the truth himself is is hearing opinion against opinion, back and forth between people. And he doesn't get, he doesn't back off as if uh, he doesn't like confrontations or he doesn't want to be part of a debate because he might be seen as someone who just, quote unquote, wants to win an argument or stir the pot. He doesn't, he isn't, Uh, beating people over the head with his theological hammer either. Nor is he concerned about whether people will accuse him of doing that. He didn't worry about people mocking him as well as if he was some type of babbler of mysterious things. And uh, it was things that he was speaking that just went over his head. He stays coarse and stands firm in his truth of salvation and God's grace in and through himself. 
He is presently active in the world, engaging with the world to bring his truth to bear upon souls. Souls that are in this world, that are in front of him, that are wrestling with all types of issues of life, and he's bringing them the greatest and most important truth. In this, he is bold and basically responds in a way that says, Stop debating. Here's the facts. Facts which are not up for debate in opinion against opinion. Opinion versus opinion. He says, this is what is true. Then he goes into those facts and continuing his teaching, which we will look at in a little bit of what that teaching was. But what we need to see is that he is presently active in the world, engaged with the world, and on offense going into the world. And too often today we shy away from this. We shy away from debate, from controversy, from going on the offense instead of retreating in defense. We do this for a couple of reasons, which are understandable, big time, but are things we need to work through. We can shy away because we may feel inadequate in our understanding or in our ability to present and articulate God's truth. These reasons can't be what keeps us out of the battle. If it is the reasons why we stay away from the battle, then who's winning? Who's getting the upper hand? Who wants that to happen? Remember, all of the course of the Christian life is a spiritual battle against the schemes of the devil. The whole Christian life is spiritual warfare. And so he wants nothing more for us to feel inadequate, for us to retreat back and to not say anything. But we need to have the confidence of John, who says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In the specific context of what John is talking about in his first letter, it has to do with knowing truth and error, and it has to do with testing those who preach who claim to preach the truth of God and to see whether they are actually from God this is at the bedrock of being active in the world in the battle that we face fighting for God's cause in the world the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who teaches truth to those who are God's possession for one so that they can fill the fulfill the great commission How are they to go out into the world and do what they're called to do without understanding what the message is about, what they're supposed to proclaim, what they're supposed to teach people? So this is a vital job of the Holy Spirit, is to teach truth. And in that, he gives us the desire, the boldness, the power, the compelling power to go out into the world and to say something. The central to that is engaging the world in an, uh, in an offense, in going at the world. So if we feel inadequate, then study and grow. Then practice, and then practice some more, then study and grow more. Know who is in you. Know who it is that equips you to do what he has called you to do. He's the one who fulfills his purpose in us. And he equips us to do that. Know who it is who empowers you in your weakness and accomplishes his purpose in and through you for his glory and for the gift to his son, which is the church. The church that is every one of God's elect that he has chosen before time began. That he brings to salvation in Jesus perfectly according to his timing, which is the salvation that he gives through his people that he sends out into the world, his world, with his truth. He sends them out with his truth. Another part of why we shy away is that we don't want to be those who just debate to quote unquote win an argument. This is a right desire but not a reason to back off. We must work through this as well. We must examine our motives, our motivations for why we engage in these conversations, these controversies, these debates with people. If we do it just uh, to win an argument, or that's our main focus, then we must repent of that and then engage. 
Because souls are at stake. Souls are at stake. And there is truth that must be proclaimed that is actually truth that's not up for debate. If we really think about it. It's actual fact. And it's truth that God uses to save sinners as he unites them to Jesus by faith. We must love our neighbor enough to tell them the truth as we deny ourselves and our impure motivations that may be what we struggle with. But if we love people in this world, the greatest love is to tell them the truth. We must do this. We must notice that Jesus isn't debating as if it's his opinion versus theirs. He's not debating. He is proclaiming objective truth. His truth. Though he may go back and forth with someone, it's not as though he just wants to, quote-unquote, win an argument. He is there to proclaim his truth. He is there to confront the unbelieving world with truth that is used to change the world into a more believing world, one sinner at a time. The truth of God is not up for debate, but is the truth that is to be left in plain sight so the world can't ignore it. The Bible opens up with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God's existence is not up for debate. God's existence is up for proclamation. Same with the truth of the gospel. The next, next aspect that we see in how Jesus is active in the world is in verse 59. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. He was out in public, openly teaching the, go- the doctrine of the gospel. He was teaching the true way of salvation in a place where people gathered. Plus, it was a gathering place where a false way of salvation was believed. It was his practice to go where these quote-unquote righteous people gathered so that they could hear the words of eternal life, the words that they desperately needed to hear, that every soul desperately needs to hear. He entered into their world, went after them. He also did this with quote-unquote sinners and entered their world to bring them the gospel of God's grace as well. See, Jesus was actively engaging the world, equipped with the gospel, and he interacted with all types of people in all types of situations within a specific society. In the appointed time, God had him there. We are all to go into the world, to all nations, with the message of salvation in Christ alone. This is a command for all the true people of God. We are called to live life where God places us and calls us to. And within those lives, everyday life, we are to be active in spreading the gospel openly, in public, whether it's around the dinner table, whether it's in an education setting, a job setting. This may be in the marketplace. This may be in Congress. This may be during a protest. This may be in the mission field as you leave your life here and go to live within another different people group. This may be in your own backyard, neighbor to neighbor. This is to use various platforms to speak about Christ as his ambassadors. Wherever God has placed us, God has called us to. The most amazing ways that God has worked in spreading his gospel is by a sinner, bringing a sinner to life, where his work through his gospel then affects their whole life. It's the change of our daily life where our speech is different. Our purpose is different. Our actions are different. Our priorities are different where everything is different. The purpose of Jesus penetrates into our regular, everyday life more and more as he works within the heart of that new creation. Calling them, using them to be out into the world. In this, we are to go into where unbelief congregates. We are to pursue the false converts, the skeptics, the atheists, the spiritual pagans, all unbelievers in the world. We're to pursue them. 
because we love them. And we know that souls are going to end up in one place or the other. Paul didn't just retreat in Athens when he saw so much evidence of idolatry. Nor should we when we see the idolatry of our day. And boy, is there a lot. Paul went into the world. And so should we. We are to do this not because we're so effective and strong. We are to do this because God is sovereign. And he has a people to save, a church to gather, and a kingdom to build. And he does it perfectly through messes like us. To achieve this, he has equipped his people with his gospel. And he is the one who sends it out into all the world through his people. We see this here in what Jesus teaches. We are to follow Jesus into all the world with his teaching. Not our version of it, not our spin of it. His teaching. What is his teaching? We've gone over it a lot, but let us see it here in this passage, especially in some points that he makes. These are the facts that are not up for debate. They are true no matter what. He lays this truth out before lifeless sinners, the words that are spirit and life. He first says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. But the people who are really wanting Jesus to bend to their wants and their ways, Jesus basically says, no. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, then this is what's true about you. You have no life in you. No matter what you think, no matter what you believe, no matter how you feel, guess what? What's true about you, if you do not do this, you have no life in you. If they had life in them, they would have come to him. But they have not done this. This is evidence of their spiritual lifelessness and unbelief. Having no life in them is something Jesus has said already, but now he is very plain, speaks very plainly to them. Life doesn't come from in the mind or in the will, but in the heart. Though their heart is physically pumping blood into their brain and the rest of their body, their heart is indeed lifeless. In the real scheme of things, as they face God in eternity, without any embarrassment, hesitation, or doubt, Jesus is clearly teaching the doctrine of total depravity, where the sinner, before being born again, has no ability or desire to please God in any capacity and do anything that would please him. They want nothing to do with Christ. There is no life in them. They must do what is most important for them to do in their spiritual life. This is the pinnacle of human history. This is the pinnacle of human life. And they must do this. Eat and drink in Jesus, but they can't. and They don't even want to. Because Jesus says, here's the truth. You have no life in you. No life in you. This is the truth that must undergird all our proclamation of Jesus. This is the truth that God uses to empty us sinners who are self-righteous by nature and clears us out, empties us out, that when he works through his gospel, we can see Christ for who he truly is, why we truly need him, And we can be covered, come to be covered by the righteousness of Christ as we come to be in Christ. If we do not know how bad our sin is, then we are not going to see Jesus for why we truly need him and for who he truly is. This is a crucial lens as well in discerning the world and looking at what the world is and how the world functions. That doctrine is so incredibly practical. So practical in so many ways. I mean, Jesus goes on and says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. 
This is the evidence of those who possess eternal life. They are eating and drinking Jesus. The character of eternal life is the ongoing partaking and eating and drinking Jesus. This is present tense active, ongoing, meaning it doesn't go away. It's very imperfect. It goes up and down, but it doesn't go away. It doesn't die off. Taking in the provision of Jesus Christ continues on from beginning to end. It's a living faith that abides, that continues. That's what this eating and drinking is. God feeds those who have faith in Jesus because he is the one who works this faith within us. And he is the one who keeps it going. He fans the flame. He causes life and growth by his grace. What does this ongoing eating and drinking look like for those who possess eternal life? How do we eat and drink in Jesus as we live day to day? The means God uses for dispensing this grace to grow in our faith in Christ is through scripture, prayer, and the church. He is at work when all of these means are rooted in and driven back to the substitutionary life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Faith grows in the body and blood of Christ through these means. As God works, the believer is sustained by the life of Jesus in ongoing faith. This is how we take him in. We are fed by God through these means. God doesn't feed us through the news or through the usual Facebook and Twitter posts or through country clubs and nightclubs or gun clubs where there's no gospel present. He fans the flame of faith through his appointed means. So we best fill our lives with that. And through these means, he affects our life, our everyday life. So then the gospel can penetrate the news. The gospel can penetrate Facebook and Twitter and gun clubs and country clubs and go into all the world. Because he's changed us. Because he's made us new and given us purpose. We must be a people who fulfill the role of disciple and being learners. We are to be students of God's word. We must be hungry for living nourishment of the living God who breathed out scripture and uses it to breathe into our lives. We must strive to be able to rightly understand and explain his words of scripture. That's a calling for every Christian, not just the pastor or the academic. We must strive to be able to rightly understand and apply God's worth faithfully. We ought to delight in what he has revealed. Delight in God's law like David. We ought to use his word as a mirror to examine our hearts, knowing that God's sanctifying work is a powerful work in conforming us to the image of his son, Jesus. We ought to use his word so that we can see how we are walking and where we are walking. The testimony of God should be the testimony that is written on and embedded in our hearts. This is the primary means by which God keeps our faith, our eating and drinking of Jesus going and growing. We also must be a people of prayer, and these things go hand in hand. Scripture and prayer go hand in hand. I've said this plenty of times before. Prayer is declaring that we are utterly dependent upon God for everything. And this is done while communing with God himself as we have access to his throne room through Jesus alone. So we eat and drink Jesus into us as we lift our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our lives up upon the almighty triune God who has shown us mercy in Christ. When my focus is on God in prayer, then my faith grows. And part of this faith in prayer is repentance and confession. But it's done with a joy running through it that knows for real and by experience that this God, my God, my Father, is a God of forgiveness and cleansing. And he doesn't fail in completing that task. Why? Because of the person and work of Jesus Christ on my behalf. 
because he is my substitute and my mediator. We also must be a people committed to the church. Within the gift to his son, which is the church, God nourishes the gift of faith within his people in extraordinary ways. He has instituted the preaching of his word to be the center of worship. This is the primary means of grace where people are fed by God. If the preaching is proclaiming Christ and him crucified, then believers are feeding upon Jesus, are taking him in to themselves. And the faithful exposition of Scripture is what the people of God are to take into them so that we can live and be sustained during our week. Because I know every week that we go through is a struggle, it's a battle. We need to be enlivened, nourished by God continually, week by week. Within the life of the church, there are other means of grace where believers feed upon Jesus by faith. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are those means of grace and ordinances that God has instituted for his people to partake in, remembering what Christ has done for them. Believers are also to take in Jesus through the life and structure of the church and its care from its leadership, care from believer to believer in community fellowship, and care from loving discipline. Scripture, prayer, and the church are the primary ways which God feeds us, Jesus. We must be taking him in. These are the parts of the ongoing faith of believers where their sustaining nourishment is the true bread and true blood of Jesus, which is true food. It's how we take in Jesus during our Christian life. All other forms of nourishment don't satisfy the human soul. This world leaves you empty. Why are we running after the world and following the world and not Christ? It's Jesus. And if it's not the true Jesus that we feed upon, then that other food, whatever it is and wherever it comes from, is a, stub, a substance that brings malnourishment and increased death instead. It just piles upon itself in decay and ruin. It must be Jesus and the true Jesus, because there's a lot of other Jesuses that are not Jesus. When we have this faith in Jesus, then the beautiful and undeserving reality is that Jesus and I are one. He is in me, and I in it, am in him. This is true if you are truly saved. This is one of the most amazing doctrines about salvation, and it is such a mystery. When we come to be saved, as we put our faith in Jesus then his life comes to be within us. The Spirit of Christ is alive in us. Jesus is united to us, just like in marriage, and what that is supposed to be, an image and a mirror for. This is a mystery in how Jesus and the believer become one, where he dwells in me. It's a mystery that we cannot fathom and comprehend. And though we can't wrap our minds around that, it's true. It is true. And while this is true, what is also true is that the believer is also in Christ. He is in me, and I am in him. This is another mystery, another part of that whole unity in Christ. Yet it's so real. It's very real. We are hidden in Christ like he is our cleft in the rock our refuge, our fortress, where we cannot be shaken or taken. Also, we are covered by Christ's righteousness, an alien righteousness that's outside of us, so that we are then in him, as he is our righteousness before God. He clothes us in his white robe, so we stand in him before God. And we are in him, in Christ in the obtaining of his blessing, in the obtaining of his inheritance. We are co-heirs with Jesus in the kingdom of God. 
So what is his is ours. Every blessing that we have, that we receive, by his sovereign grace as we are in him, pours out from Jesus' position at the right hand of God. We're in him. And there's so much more that could be said about the beauty of what that means. All this and more means that this union in Christ has no end. It has no end. Because Jesus dwells within the believer and the believer is in Christ, this reality will never, ever, ever, ever change. Nothing can separate us from Jesus. Nothing. Not even ourselves. That union can never be broken. And plus, it is an ongoing union that is living, which is realized and experienced in the ongoing eating and drinking of Jesus. Are you eating and drinking Jesus in? Have you even done it first? And then are you abiding in that? Are you taking him in in your daily life as he is your nourishment? These analogies of eating and drinking are very real. Because Jesus and the truth that is in him is real spiritual food that we take into ourselves from beginning to end. From new life, regeneration to glorification. We live because he lives. We live because he came to live, die, and have victory over death and his resurrection for us as our substitute, trading places with us. That life is our life when we are in Christ. We then live forever when God has freely given us this life, this salvation. When he has freely given us the gift of Christ, Jesus himself. This is the truth that Jesus taught. It's the truth that's not up for debate. It's true regardless of opinions, beliefs, or feelings. This is the truth that is to be laid before the world. This is the truth that will be ridiculed. This is the truth that we will be labeled, and especially today, extremist, exclusive, bigoted, and unloving. This is the truth that will cause friction and division. But regardless of what may come our way, if we are people of God in Christ truly, this is the truth that we cling to, that we love, and that we speak, that we proclaim. And in our life is the support backing that. In living and following Christ and showing that that is a hard life. (laughs) This is his truth. We cling to it, we love it, we proclaim it. We proclaim it because we love souls and care where they end up. We desire more than anything for others to know Jesus, who is Lord and Savior, who is King and Deliverer. Though the world fights back at us. There's people that don't leave our hearts that we have burdens for for the rest of our life and we look for every opportunity to continue to tell them about Christ. We don't give up because we care where they'll end up. And further, this is the truth that is to be the filter through which we examine everything that is going on in this world, in our world that we live in, from who our president is to what his or her policies are to what health secretaries and other officials say to what choices people make to how we understand social issues to when and how we engage in the world to what the church is to where we get our education from and everything else everything else you name it and the truth 
that Jesus has clearly proclaimed here and everywhere else in his world is to be our filter and our foundation. We are to follow Jesus into all the world with this truth, his truth and its doctrine and application. We are to follow along his path which means we are to take our cues from him, not the world. And not even what the quote-unquote new or, or modern church says. We are to take our cues from him. What he does and what he says. The issue of justice starts with Christ. The issue of morality starts with Christ. The issue of human identity starts with Christ. The issue of authority starts with Christ. He has dominion over this world. All of this connects to the issue of and need for salvation, which starts with Christ and ends with Christ. It's in Christ. We must lay this truth of God out before the world with a joy that withstands the backlash. Because that will come in many, many forms. Our joy is in the Lord. Not in anything or anyone else. It's in Christ. We rejoice in His truth that He has graciously revealed to us. A truth that we had no capacity, no ability to understand. And we even thought it was foolishness. And Jesus didn't lose His joy when a bunch of people turned away from Him. And we'll see this very shortly. And we shouldn't lose our joy when people turn away from us. Our joy is not in them. Our joy is in Christ. There will be some where the truth will set them free. Thanks be to God. We may not see the fruit before our eyes this side of eternity. And others will turn away. Guaranteed. And both are guaranteed. God is a certain a God of certainty. And Jesus didn't quote unquote win the argument here. But he proclaimed the words of eternal life. No one is out of God's reach of grace. We take heart that God reaches his hand out through his gospel and pulls those that he gave Jesus before the foundation of the world. He pulls them out of their life to give them life and safety, to deliver them and to justify them before God. The sovereign and merciful shepherd gathers his wandering sheep into his fold, every one of them. This happens as his gospel truth spreads out into all the world, and he's the one who does this. He spreads it. So let us find courage and action in our day which is very needed in our day to spread his gospel as Jesus does here. We must do this as we battle for the eternal state of souls. Find courage and strength in Christ and in Christ alone. Find motivation and action in Christ and in Christ alone. Let us pray.